flight time this morning is at two hours and 27 minutes, cruising up to 29,000 feet. The weather here uh, at St. John's for arrival this morning, winds are in the south at 20 gusts to 35 miles per hour. Hiroshima 55 years ago. Today marks a different anniversary, the day the Americans dropped the second atomic bomb on the port city of Nagasaki. Jack Ford witnessed the horror from the camp where he was imprisoned for three years as a prisoner of war. Three days earlier, Satsuko Nakamura Thurlow watched her home city of Hiroshima be obliterated by the first bomb. She lost family and friends. Today in St. John's, the two met for the first time. Sutsuko and Jack came into our studio to tell their stories. Well, I'm a survivor in Nagasaki. This is the very day that the bomb was dropped in Nagasaki, at 11 o'clock this morning. She's Hiroshima, and I'm Nagasaki. And she felt that she should have a talk with me sometime. And she's talked to me many times on the phone. But she's never met me in person until yesterday. And I think it's wonderful for her to come down here and say hello to not an old friend, mind you. Certainly wasn't a friend, but a comrade, because we were there together. We were enemies when this happened 55 years ago. But we can't afford to be in that relationship. I want to be friends. Mr. Ford, perhaps you could start by telling us what you were doing in Nagasaki. Well, I, actually, I was taken prisoner of war after the fall of Singapore and Sumatra and Java. And then from Java, I was taken to Nagasaki, Japan in December 1942. And I was working in the dockyard with the Mitsubishi people up till they dropped the bomb, which was two years and nine months. This is our prison camp right here. We walked down to the dockyard. And when they dropped, this is Nagasaki right here. And when the bomb dropped, I was working right here in the end of the dock, operating the guillotine with a roof over my head. And of course the roof came down. I could see Nagasaki quite clearly. There were a group of prisoners of war in our camp, perhaps when the war ended, about six to 800 people. And it was just another day in our life. We had been hoping and praying for the war to come to an end because we'd been prisoners of war for nearly three years and seven months. And that's a long time out of a young man's life. The best years of our lives, actually, 22, 23, 24, 25. When we got back to camp that night, this end of the building was blown completely out from the blast. That was completely on the ground. So from the blast over here, we were in between. That end was gone entirely. At 11 o'clock or two months after 11, I was about to go for a bucket of tea from the guillotine. And suddenly, I looked towards Nagasaki, and I felt the intense heat and the blast and I watched the mushroom. And of course, the first thought came to me, as all other people that were there, this must be the end of the world. Setsuko, you were a young girl when the first atomic bomb uh, destroyed your city in Hiroshima. What are your memories of that day? I saw the bluish white flash throughout the window, and I had the sensation of floating in the air. And that's the end of my memory. By the time I came out, the building was on fire. 
that meant most of my classmates were all burned to death alive. And it was very dark, although it was in the morning, it was like twilight because of all the soot and the particles and smoke in the mushroom cloud. As my eyes got used to this darkness, I began to see moving objects, and they were survivors. They looked like ghosts. They were slowly shuffling from the center part of the city. This is how we separated into two groups, the ones that were going to be safe and the ones that were going to be killed. The way they looked, they were blackened and burned, and some were beginning to swell already. Hair was burned, and the hair was just standing up toward the sky, and the skins were peeling, flesh was hanging from their bones, and the parts of the body mutilated. And I saw some people's eyes just liquefied, or even popped out and holding them, just indescribable scene I witness. It was really hell on earth. There was no air raid warning sounded. There wasn't a thing. All of a sudden, the city of Nagasaki was devastated. And we were told a few days after that, as many as 70,000 people were killed instantly. I saw lots of fires. I saw lots of flattened buildings. I saw a terrible smell of human flesh. The stench was nearly unbearable. And this is coming from the bodies that had been burned in Nagasaki. That alone would turn, turn one of ever thinking that this could ever happen again in a civilized world. A girl of about 20 came struggling up the road. Her clothes were in shreds and her hair in disorder. Every inch of the ground was covered with the dead and dying people. I never heard anybody screaming or shouting or running. Nobody had that kind of psychological and physical strength left. They were simply in very faint voice asking for water, water please. The people who were outside, who were exposed to that heat, they were just scorched, you know, they were burned and they became swollen beyond recognition. I could recognize my sister only by her voice. And my mother also noticed the unique hairpin she had. So that was the only way we could identify her as my sister. Uh, that's one kind of injury. But... Mm, my sister-in-law, who was in the center part of the city, directing the high school students with their work to clear for the fire lane they were building, they simply melted, simply melted, vaporized. We searched for her body's body for several days. We never found it. So she left two young children as orphans. My parents looked after them. We went to work for a week after they dropped the bomb. And all we could see was people make a little carpenters to make little caskets for the people that were killed. There were literally dozens of people coming from Nagasaki, because they had a ferry running from where we were to Nagasaki. And they were bringing over patients to go in the hospital. We had a little hospital on the island. And it's, I'd see them going back and forth on their stretcher. And, and they'd be burned just like a piece of raw beef and screeching. And there was a lot of that went on. We saw a lot of that. 
But the most unique kind of problem, a medical problem, atomic bomb cause, is the mysterious effect of radiation. Because my uncle and aunt looked all right. They had no external injury. But a couple of weeks later, uh, they started vomiting and became sick. And uh, my parents went and looked after them until their death. According to my mother, in, they looked all right outside. They had purple spots all over the body. And, uh, and she said that their internal organs seem to be rotting, dissolving, and coming out in a thick black liquid. Take care of my little girl. Water, she begged me. Give me water. She had diarrhea. She, she cried. It was water. And wailing, Mama, where's Mama? Please take my child with you. Her arm was broken. The child was covered with red spots. It couldn't even cry. It just made gasping sounds in its throat. Then it began to have convulsions. Three times the convulsion seized it, and the third time it died. Trinity is a very powerful piece of music. It's probably one of the, the uh, most profound pieces that come out of the 20th century. Seven children, seven young children, uh, uh, who described their actual living through the bombing of Nagasaki uh, and Hiroshima when the whole force came together the first time. Uh, it was more powerful even than we had anticipated. When we performed it, everybody, we had to stop at the end of it and everybody cried. Having Mr. Schaefer come and explain it to them and explain how we put it together and spend time with the children in the choir it was an experience they'll always remember and to have him come and interpret it for them and uh, then to want them to present his work to the children of a city in Japan was just an amazing experience for the children. They were uh, most thrilled to have Mr. Schaefer with them and to explain how he put it together and why he felt this was necessary and how it was up to them, uh, the young people, to never let the world forget what happened. And, you know, as hard as it was for them, it was necessary. Setsuko, this, is this your first visit to St. John's? Yes, indeed. And what brings you here? To meet Jack Ford. We have been talking over the phone. We have written to each other. And I, was, I have been waiting for the first chance to come and visit with him. And I am delighted. How are you doing? All right? Hello. This is my wife. How do you do? Pleased to meet you. Yeah. Yeah. long last? Yes. yes. It's been a long time right. since we started corresponding. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. I was worried yes. about you. Yes. yes, I was, yeah. Well, I was missing for 18 months. Yeah. Missing in action, 18 yeah. months, yes. Yeah. Mm. But I finally showed up anyway. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's Young man. Yes. That's in 1940 in, in Blackpool in England. I went away as a young man. I came back as an old man. The situation we had at that time was very, very yes. difficult. Yes. And we were trying our best to survive. Yeah. And out of the total we had there, there were a lot of people who didn't survive. Yes. And you didn't yes. know what day that you were mm -hmm. going to be the next on the list. Mm -hmm. And right. life didn't mean a thing to us while we were there. Had the war last another six months. Up to December of that year, 45, a lot of us wouldn't have been here. We were down at 93 pounds, in lower than that. So I was 93. And we just had no energy to strength to carry on our day-to-day -day work. Just couldn't do it. Now, I know they had a situation, they had a, they had a war win. I know all about that. But no justification for being so rough to us. For starting us, no medical supplies. These are hard things for me to forget. Yes. But uh, you can never forget. You never forget. You, uh, you but never I do, do forgive it. them because I think can only you? a few. Oh yes, I forgive them because only a few people did this, and I think they got most of them that were guilty. I think they got most of them were guilty. For years, I never got to talk to anybody about it. Yeah. Not a word. Yeah. yeah. I would love to have gone to Nagasaki. 
I'd love to go on back to see where I work in the dockyard. Yeah, I'd like yeah. to be there for the thing, but yes. it's too late in life now, see. Why do you say that? Well, I know you have well, a sick I got wife. A sick, I can't leave her. No. I left her the other day and she had an angina attack. She oh, had to get yeah. somebody called oh, when I got home or somebody here. I'd only gone 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. She was in bad state when I got home. I so I couldn't leave her. I can't leave her anywhere. Mm -hmm. And in addition to that, I, I, I'm fit to travel. At, at my age, I'm fit to travel. I can go anywhere. You look at yeah. me, yes. But I couldn't take her. I can't take her out no, of town no, unless no, I'm in no. reach of a hospital. I you know? would recommend that. She lives on a handful of pills every day. Margaret, what are you taking a pill oh, today now, Margaret? Pardon? How many pills are you taking a day? How many? Hmm. For one person. <laughs> on all these. Yeah. Well, oh. I have to take two of uh, two of that one. And two of that one. Two of that one. One of that one, three of that one, and three of that one. What are these for? Just for heart? Heart, heart, heart and blood pressure. Yeah. Oh. Oh, yeah. Can't get my blood pressure down. Blood pressure, 210, 200? Yeah. But I don't worry about it, see? <laughs> Good thing you don't. Yes. Yeah. The blood pressure's way up. Mm. At the end of the war in Nagasaki, life didn't mean a great lot to me. After being there for three years and seven months of prisoner of war, I couldn't care less what happened the next day. This all happened 55 years ago, more than 55 years ago now. Have the memories um, stayed as vibrant with you, as, as strong? Yes. Be it's important for me to remember because I consider it's my mission that instead of just keeping that memory to myself, but to share that memory with the rest of the world. Because we didn't just use two bombs and that's it. The problem became worse and worse and worse in the past 55 years. And unless humanity becomes smartened up and know what's going on, we are going to commit genocide ourselves. And we can't afford to do that. This life is too beautiful. The world is too beautiful. We have to preserve this for our children and grandchildren and the following generation. That is our moral imperative. I feel very strongly about it. For that reason, I keep talking about it. And every time I talk, I remember more vividly. Canada has listened to our voice, and the Canadian government as a whole has said no to the United States, which is hoping to build the National Missile Defense Program. Not just Canada, but many of the European countries are saying, no, this is insane. This is illusion. So. I'm proud to be Canadian. Unfortunately, some people are enlightened and informed on this issue, but the majority of people are sleepwalking. So it's, our job is to tell them, come on, wake up, stop sleepwalking. across Newfoundland and Labrador. This is On The Go for Thursday, August the 10th. Good afternoon, I'm Allison Butler. Coming up on the show today, Disappearing Cities. Today we'll run part two of a conversation with Jack Ford and Sesko Nakamura Thurlow. Yesterday they recalled their memories of the destruction of Hiroshima and Nagasaki by atomic bombs. Today they'll talk about the future and what the world should have learned from that devastation. The atomic bombs that I saw in Nagasaki I didn't see the one in Hiroshima. If there's ever another nuclear war, the world can be destroyed in a very short time. There's no question about that at all. You can destroy the world in a matter of moments by pressing the wrong button. And obviously, no one wants to see that, but it can happen. In North Korea had a missile. And as far as I'm concerned, there's no place for them. How do we eliminate them? I don't know. But like our friend here said, and I'm very pleased that you came here to visit me. It's a pleasure. And I remember it for a long time. But having said that, war is not comfortable in anybody's books. 
if we saw some of the weapons they got today, which is ten times as powerful as the fat man in Nagasaki and the small man on Hiroshima, just think what it could do with the world and people, with the flesh hanging out of them, bleeding all over the place. And I saw many of bodies like that. Do you think that I can tolerate that? Do you think I like that? No, I didn't like it, not even if they were Japanese, and they were my enemy at that time. I certainly didn't like it, and I still don't like it to this very day. And I certainly hope, let's be common sense, and abolish nuclear arms and atomic weapons, and let's try to spend our money in a more peaceful and humane society. I think our friend here will confer with that, too. I, you got to agree with that's what we, our aim is. Whether we'll have any success or not, we're not sure. But if we don't talk, we'll never have any success, that's for sure. John Ford, is this the first time that you've met a survivor from Hiroshima? This is the first occasion that I have met a survivor from Hiroshima or Nagasaki. I've never had the opportunity to meet anyone that actually survived the prison life in Japan. Not, I don't know, not, not mentioning the atomic bomb, but I've never, it's the first time I've ever mentioned or seen anybody and had the opportunity to talk to someone about it. And my personal wish is that it's, he would have the opportunity to go back to Nagasaki and see the city. Uh, I would love to go back to Nagasaki, as I told you a little earlier. I'd love to. But at my stage of the game now, I feel that it wouldn't be appropriate to be taken on. My wife is on in years, and of course, there's only two of us. And I've got to stay by her side as much as I can on account of her medical situation. Ten years ago, I think you mentioned to me we're going to Nagasaki, and I would be most delighted to visit Nagasaki and see my civilian friends, perhaps, who I worked with in the dockyard. They couldn't share any food with us because they had nothing to share for themselves and their families. But they certainly didn't mistreat us. Some of them could be alive today, but I would say the majority of them would have passed on because they were up in years at that time. But I would love to get to Nagasaki, a beautiful city. I want to thank the two of you for coming in today, and uh, I'm sure that the next couple of days, uh, spending time together is going to be quite meaningful and important to both of you. And I want to thank you for taking the time to come in this morning and speak with me. Thank you very much. Thank it's you. it's been my pleasure to be with Tuto and also with the CBC here. Jack Ford was a prisoner of war in Nagasaki when the bomb dropped there 55 years ago. Setsuko Nakamura Thurlow was in Hiroshima when that city was devastated by the first atomic bomb. <laughs> Do it together. Right. It's three That's minutes right. before news. You see, these are people who died during the war, 44, 45, 46. Now, I buried most of these fellas. I say, did the ritual over them. Just that I knew them were friends, and they asked me if I'd be kind enough to do the ritual over them. We thank them for their service, and they, we hope that the world is a better place to live because of, of them. They shall not grow old as we lift it, as we are left old. Age shall not weary them, but a year is condemned. At the going down the sun, and in the morning, we will remember them. That's the act of remembrance. <laughs>